So welcome everybody. So I don't know how many of you have read the, the list of banned books for, from 2020, or you're probably familiar with the, hundred, the list of 100 books. But we'll kind of take some time to go over it. I am Tammy Thiem from the Three Rivers Library System. And I'm just shouting out some information that they have. See, I'm kind of curious if anybody has any displays they're going to be putting up next week. And maybe this will encourage people to or make your list of books to read grow. There we go. But yes, Band Book Week, Books Week is September 26th through October 2nd this year. And they started that in 1982. They had books being challenged and having a, book, a week to highlight this, felt the awareness of the First Amendment and worked to promote freedom and access to information for libraries. And the American Library Associ Association keeps track of how many books are challenged. So they said in 2020, they were told of 273 books that were challenged in libraries, schools, universities. Chances are there were a lot more challenged that I can't say that I would think if I had ever had a book challenged. I don't know that I'd have been able to think ahead to actually let the ALA know about it. So I bet there are maybe it's even more than three or four times as many. So we'll start by going over the 10 most challenged books of 2020. Number 10 was The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. And I will just let everybody take a chance to read over the, the review about it. I'm curious if anyone has read it. I read it, Tammy. Awesome. Um, would you recommend it? Absolutely. <laughs> Especially because it's on the banned books list. <laughs> I've read it too, and I, I actually did like it. It was very eye-opening. I think it's a good, the movie is really good, so it's a great, um, be a great pairing to compare and contrast with a group of teens. Yes, absolutely. And based on if you have read the book or having read the review, does anybody have any guess of what reasons it was challenged? Any, any ideas? This is Jenny. Um, I know that challenges to books kind of reflect the anxieties of society at that time. So um, I know that a lot of books are challenged because of negative portrayals of the police right now. So I haven't read this book. I've only read the blurb about it. So that's, that's what I'm thinking. Um, I'm a high school librarian in Millard, and this is part of our curriculum. And I had a parent who's um, a, a friend of mine whose husband is a police officer. And she called to ask me why I thought this book was, you know, being read in class. And, and we, you know, I kind of talked about it. And it was a class that my child had already taken. So I was able to talk with her as a parent and what was discussed. And I recommended that she have, you know, read the book herself so she knew exactly what was going on in the story. So then when her daughter was, you know, in class and they were talking about certain things that at least they were both on the same page as what the story actually said and what the conversations that were being had in the classroom were. What a good opportunity for discussion. Wow. 
Yeah, so the reason it was challenged was for profanity and it was thought to promote an anti-police message, which yes, I think like Jenny said too, it goes along with the times, what was happening and the anxiety that was happening in the world at the time. Number nine, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. And again, I'll give everybody a chance to read over the blurb on this. Has anybody read this book? This is Jennifer. I've read this one multiple times. So obviously, yeah. you recommend it. Um, any ideas? The reasons why it would have been challenged? Probably because of the blue eye thing. It was banned and challenged because it was considered sexually explicit and depicts child sexual abuse, which makes me think it had to be a pretty gut-wrenching read. Wasn't this book, um, didn't it win a Nobel Prize for literature? You know, I didn't come across that, but I would not be surprised. It's on my to-be-read list now. I think Toni Morrison actually won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Maybe for multiple books, huh? Right. Yeah, a book, a singular book's not given a Nobel. Oh, I was thinking that the copy that we have, because we have a display up, and I thought ours said something that it was that it was a Nobel Prize for Literature or something. So maybe it was maybe it was mentioning the author and not the book. I guess I would have to look again. Right, isn't that funny that a book could be, that could be so impactful makes this list um, of mice and men. I know my kids, I think all four had to read this in school or got to read it in school. I think they actually enjoyed the book. So I'll give you time to read um, the synopsis on this. Now this one's considered a classic. Has anybody read this one? A long time ago. <laughs> now I'm surprised I did not because when my kids would have books to read in school, we usually would get a list, which I don't know if still, schools still do that, but you'd get a list of what they're reading requirements were going to be, and I usually tried to read them the same time the kids did so that we could discuss them. But Okay, based on this, does anybody have an idea of the reason why it was challenged? It was banned and challenged for racial slurs and racist stereotypes and their negative effect on students. Number seven, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Has everybody read this book? This is Jenny again. I'm sorry to say that I didn't read this book until I was 24 years old. And um, I think maybe it's good that I didn't read it in school as an assignment because I was incredibly, you know, odd, overwhelmed. Just, I, it's, it's just a magnificent book. And uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I did read it. 
Yeah, I've read it a few times. And it was chosen as the number one um, in the PBS Great American Read a few years ago. So any guess the reasons why this one would have been challenged? I think it just goes back to that Rachel, Rachel stuff again, the language. Yes, racial slurs and their negative effect on students featuring a white savior character and its perception of the black experience. So I thought it was a pretty powerful book as well. Um, number six, it happened in our town, something happened in our town, a child's story about racial injustice. And this book is actually written for children. I think that's a little bit different um, than books for adults. But it follows two families, one white, one black, as they discuss a police shooting of a black man in their community. The story aims to answer children's questions about such traumatic experiences and to help children identify and counter racial injustice in their own lives. So based on that, any ideas why it would be challenged? Divisive language and because it was thought to promote anti-police views. And an interesting thing about this book is it was actually in Papillion La Vista here in Nebraska the schools had put it on their list of resources without it being properly vetted. And the teachers used it which out, without realizing it had not been approved. Um, and some parents um, disapproved of it. And I think it actually did get taken off the list. The book's purpose was to promote discussion about racism and social injustice. But the reason for pushback is the perception of negativity toward police officers. So if you if you haven't heard about this local instance, you can find it just with a Google search. And I have a link to this one at the end of the slide. Just anybody have any discussion or comments about this? Have you heard about this story in the news? If not, we'll go on. Uh, the Absolutely True Diary, Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Thurman Alexi. Has anybody read this book? I have read this one. This is also part of our curriculum in Millard. This is Jennifer. I've used that book several times for teen book clubs. I'll give a little bit here to read the blurb. And having read the book or just seeing what you see, any thoughts why it was challenged? I know there's masturbation that happens in the book a couple of times. I know that's a, a, a part of it that is a problem for some people. Has that caused any problems in your class discussions? Um, I mean, you get the giggles, of course, when um, you know the kids are either D discussing or you know or, or bringing it up in class but I from my understanding talking to my different teachers here you know if, if it's a part that's read aloud to a class it's it's just read and continued through and um, you know the teachers just try to to handle it the best they can and then others choose to make sure they're not reading that part aloud um, you know not that they're afraid to necessarily discuss it but they don't necessarily read mm -hmm chapter out loud or whatever it might be, depending on the class. Right, why open the door to something you know has potential? Did you have anything to add, Jennifer? No, um, 
the kids, other than the, the kids that I read it with, they all enjoyed it and we had good discussion. It was banned and challenged for profanity, sexual references, and allegations of sexual misconduct by the author. So his personal um, experiences got brought into the reflection of the book as well, I think. This is Jenny again. Jenny. May I just interrupt with a quick question that might take us on a little bit of a tangent? Sure. Do you find that the author's, um, not the author's work, but the author's, I guess, life or comments or arrest record <laughs> influences how you enjoy or don't enjoy their work? I think so. Um, look at J.K. Rawlings, um, kind of the pushback that has happened with her recently. Or even actors and actresses. Um, Sometimes if you see personal aspects of them that you may not agree with, it maybe will dampen your enthusiasm to watch them on TV. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. Um, I don't think that, okay. Because <laughs> I'm thinking of like Bill Cosby. I mean, he was, you know, straight up arrested. Um, but then I'm also thinking of like, um, Marion Zimmer Bradley, who had accusations of child abuse, and Orson Scott Card, who has said some wackadoo things about uh, GLBTQ. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think that we should um, challenge their books, but I just think that you don't have to put any money in their pocket. <laughs> um, by purchasing or reading their books. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm taking us off on a tangent and I apologize. I'll let you get back to it, Tammy. Oh, that's all good. No, and, I, and I think this book was already on a list before um, some of the other Alexi Sherman personal things came out. I mean, this book was definitely one that um, had had some issues before um, his, his alleged whatever he had going on. <laughs> I don't remember now quite what it was either. I think he was inappropriate at, wasn't it like when he did like, like book signings and, and book readings and stuff? I think he was inappropriate with females um, somewhere in that realm, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that sounds right. Hmm. Uh, number four, Speak by Lori Halsey Anderson. I'll let you read this. And has anybody read this book? This is another one that's part of our curriculum in Miller and I'm starting to um, notice here every single book that we've talked about so far um, with the exception of the something happened is is somewhere in our curriculum um, as an option, if not like a requirement. Speak at one time was the um, cornerstone novel for all ninth graders. So this book has been very big here um, in Millard for a long time. It's funny, I read this book for a class and I was homeschooling my granddaughter at the time who was like in fifth grade. And I said, well, this will be one you should read in a few years when you're older. What, I'm not old enough? Why, why can't I read it now? I think she's probably read it 10 times because it was taboo. And there's nothing wrong with it. I just thought it was probably um, more suitable for ninth graders. Um, based on what you know of this book, what do you think it would be the reasons? because of sexual content. I'm having a hard time looking at the chat with the 
slideshow up. Apologies if I'm overlooking any chat information. It was banned, challenged, and restricted because it was thought to contain a political viewpoint and it was claimed to be biased against male students and for the novel's inclusion of rape and profanity. But I read the book and I do recommend it. Um, number three on the list, All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brendan Keeley. Has anybody read this book? I'll give you a chance to read the blurb. Am I going too fast advancing the slides or too slow? Okay. So any idea why this one would have been challenged? I believe this is another police brutality issue. Banned and challenged for profanity, drug use, and alcoholism in a, because it was thought to promote anti-police views, contain divisive topics, and be too much of a sensitive matter right now. And number two, damped racism. I've got this in the way. Anti-racism in you by X Kendi and Jason Reynolds. Again, Jason Reynolds on the list. Let you read this blurb. I'm sorry, Ibram X. Candy. So based on the trend, can everyone kind of guess why this one was challenged? It was banned and challenged because of author's public statements and because of claims that the book contains selective storytelling incidents and does not encompass racism against all people. Some pretty unique um, reasons. Okay, we'll see if I can get the vid video to work right here um, and let me know if you're not able to hear it. Hi everybody, this is Jason Reynolds and uh, I am your honorary chair for this year's Band Books Week. Um, which is taking place September 26th to October 2nd. I'm very excited about it. And most importantly, I'm excited about this year's theme, which is so simple, yet um, so powerful. The theme is books unite us, censorship divides us. It's cut and dry, you know? The concept is baked into the theme, but in case you know we, we need to sort of expound on it a bit more, let me just say this. What does it mean when we say that books unite us? It means that books can be the tethers, that books can connect human beings, it can connect us culturally, it can connect gender to gender, it can connect person to person, um, um, you know, socioeconomic statuses and all sorts of other things. These tools, uh, these narratives, these stories are the things that we use to ground us in our humanity, the things that convince us that we're not actually that different and the things that are actually different about us should be celebrated because they are what makes this tapestry of life, right? this beautiful patchwork that we all um, so gratefully are living. What does it mean when we say that censorship divides us? 
It means that any time that we eliminate or, or wall off some of those narratives, then we're not getting a whole picture of the world in which we live, which means we don't actually have a full view of life, which means we then run the risk of becoming harmful, of navigating the world in a way that is that is closed off, closed-minded, um, and, and ultimately, to some extent, can run the risk of becoming poison. It means that we limit our vocabulary, which means that we then sort of complicate the way that we even can communicate with the world, right? Like to censor a book is to damage the framework in which we live, right? Seems drastic, but it's not. And so I want you all to join us this this week for Banned Books Week as we uh, fight against censorship, as we celebrate books that live on the shelves and work to ensure that all books have a space on the shelves uh, and the opportunity to live in the psyches of our children as they grow into the human beings that will inherit this wonderful place. Um, I hope you all join us. Um, for more info, check out bandbooksweek.org. And again, I'm your honorary chair, which I'm very happy about, and I'll let y'all soon. Peace. Awesome. Well said. Okay, does anybody have a guess or maybe you already know what was the number one most challenged book in 2020? And it was George by Alex Gino. And uh, when people look at George, they think they see a boy but she knows she's not a boy. She knows she's a girl. George thinks she'll have to keep this a secret forever. Then her teacher, teacher announces that their class play is going to be Charlotte's Web. George really, really, really wants to play Charlotte, but the teacher says she can't even try out for the part because she's a boy. With the help of her best friend, Kelly, George comes up with a plan. Not just so she can be Charlotte, but so everyone can see who she is once and for all. And again, I think it's a little different context when it's a children's book. People are a little more passionate about it. Whoops. I was going to check the... Oh, Liz, yes, George, yep. What grade level is this book written for? I think it is young, like second and third grade. Anybody else have any ideas? Yeah, I would say elementary students. I mean, it is a picture book pretty much. And the reasons it's challenged, banned and restricted for LGBTQIA plus content conflicting with a religious viewpoint and not reflecting the views of our community. Okay, so did any of the choices surprise you? Have you read any of them? And do you have any in your library? And if you do, are they popular with your patrons? Are there comments, stories, examples? I'd love any of you or all of you to have a platform and share your experiences. I was just gonna share that when I was at the Neely Public Library, I had a parent question um, the Hunger Games, why any teenager or why anybody would want to read that with all the, the violence and death in it. Um, he never formally you know, pursued the challenge. It was just a verbal comment, I guess. That's interesting. And I'm sure that you probably have a form available if there was actually. Oh, yes, ab yes, absolutely. Policies and. Yeah, it's best to be prepared because you never know. Any other comments? I have the hate you give, um, but it's never been checked out. Um, and one, Angie. the hate, the hate you give, no one has ever checked it out. Um, and we do have 
a few people in town that are very deeply religious um, and Harry Potter offends them a little bit. <laughs> so uh, they don't challenge it. They just, um, they don't believe that that is something they want their children to read. And it is a parent's prerogative. Mm -hmm. So yep. I know my predecessor, when I was in the public library, she had a religious woman come in and say that she had to take Harry Potter off the shelf. And so she said, so when you read the book, what did you not like about it? Well, I didn't read the book. Okay, well, after you read the book, you can fill out this form. And so it was dropped. <laughs> I've not really had anyone challenge any books. Um, I've had, I, did, I did have um, an adult book that actually I had one of my patrons say was probably one of the most violent books they had ever read. Um, but we just left it. It was a popular author and she was the only one that said that. So, But I did kind of visit with my patrons that checked it out to let them know that maybe this book was a little more violent than ones she had written before. What book was that? It was a Lisa Jackson, and I can't actually remember what the book was called. Um, but my mom, I made my mom read it, and I read it, and it was, it was pretty graphically violent. So, but I didn't have anybody else come back and complain. Just one person. So, I mean, her books are, you know, murder and mayhem. So, really, what did you expect going in? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> yeah. I um, I was just reading the um, the field report. Um, I ordered in our banned book leak materials, but I was reading this, and um, there is a challenge from the Columbus Public Library. The title was. Uh, Somebody Else's Daughter by Elizabeth Brundage. So of course I had to check and see if we had that in our library. We do not have that title, but uh, Columbus made the, <laughs> the field report from the ALA. So now I have to email Karen and ask about it. Right. So is it a book for kids or is it an adult book? Um, it looked like it was an adult book. Um, the person was complaining about the, uh, oh, it says right here, adult thrillers, filthy language and disappointing storyline. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to be respectful, but I want to giggle because there are so many disappointing books out there but you can't you, I don't think this library should carry this book because this book is just so much crap it's so disappointing and then other people may absolutely love it exactly and there are a few more things in chat but it does look like the Columbus Library Board after their reconsideration process, voted to retain the item. Okay, so they, they had policies and they followed it and everybody's happy. <laughs> uh, so what books have been most challenged? ALA has created the top 100 list from 2010 to 2020. So I'm curious how many you've read, and if you're a rebel and want to read them all, putting this together made me my list grow and grow. And do any of you have you already, or do you put up displays in your libraries? Of Jenny says, yeah. We put up a display every year in our high school library, and we we've, we've actually had it up for two weeks already. Awesome. And does it is it a popular site to for the patrons to grab books? It is because it's the first thing they see when they walk in, like they literally have to walk around the display. So um, we, we only have a, 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 you know, 10 or 12 up at a time with little like explanations of why the book has been um, 
either banned or challenged. And we've had a lot of kids ask questions. I've had classes come down and I've given full presentations on um, books that have been um, challenged and, and banned, including elementary um, books and things like that. So it's it's been actually really good here. Wow, what a lot of great discussion and interaction it sounds like. Yeah, I was just going to add that Banned Books Week was always my favorite or is my favorite week of the year. Um, and I've done displays using um, crime scene tape or I've locked them up behind um, locked doors and just really um, encourage people to understand their right to read during that week as and always. So love this time of year. Yeah, like I said, my list has grown and these books, a lot of them have always been there. It's just, oh, I want to see this. Okay, so um, the number one challenge book was the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian. Um, Captain Underpants, the whole series. 13 Reasons Why, which I find this interesting in AR, the accelerated reader, it's like a reading level three. So it's kind of a, yeah, as a librarian or as a, a parent, it's like, oh, do I want this with the kids' books with that reading level? Do you, yeah. Did you know that The Catcher in the Rye is a reading level number four? Really? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know about that book. I, I'm sure it's on the list here somewhere, but I read it and I was, I got to the end, was waiting for the plot. But that's my opinion. I'm sure there's people who loved it. Uh, Looking for Alaska, John Green. I think he's on here a few times. George was number five. And Tango Makes Three. And that one is a children's book too, I believe. Drama by Irina Telgemeier, which I think a lot of kids love those, a lot of girls. Fifty Shades of Grey, Internet Girls series. And The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. The top 10, uh, The Kite Runner. Has anybody read that book? I guess I did. I thought. Yes, I read it. And would you recommend it, Jennifer? Oh, yes, it was a fabulous book. In fact, I think we had, I think a teen book group actually read that book. I know I can't, I can't recall, but yeah. Yeah, it's, I thought it was a pretty powerful book. Wow. Uh, Hunger, ja Hunger Games, I Am Jazz, which I think that was a kid's book too, if I remember correctly. The Perks of Being a Wallflower, To Kill a Mockingbird, Bone, the series by Jeff Smith, The Glass Castle, Two Boys Kissing by David Levithan, A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo, and Sex is a Funny Word, um, so don't know if those are on your to be read list. A lot of them made mine. <laughs> Alice McKinley is perfectly normal. 19 minutes, scary so stories, speak, which I think is a graphic novel also now. A Brave New World, Jan Magenta, Transgender Teens Speak Out, Of Mice and Men, The Handmaid's Tale, and The Hate You Give. And I think someone had mentioned in the chat, and again, I'm sorry to ignore the chat, um, Jessica from Battle Creek said that she had gotten like stamped in the hate you give and they didn't leave the library. It's, it's just amazing what you can try to have out there to make sure you reach, um, that you have information, have books out there for everybody and some just get walked on past. Okay, Fun Home, A Family tra Tragicomic. It's a book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The Things They Carried, What My Mother Doesn't Know, A Child Called It, which that surprised me. I think that was big when I was young. Bad Kitty, Frank. I think Ellen Hopkins has made the list a few times too. Nickel and Dimed and Persepolis.
and yeah, Huckleberry Finn. This one, it was a big thing about they wanted that one word that's in there like 219 times changed or eliminated. So here's a blurb on that. There ain't no home like a raft. Like this movie about Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain's classic book still navigates America's river of race relations. Twain's classic used racial slurs, words customary for Twain's time, but today, radioactive. On one page of Huck Finn, Twain wrote the N-word six times. Should each one be edited out and replaced with the word slave? Alan Gribben says yes. He's a Twain scholar at Auburn University at Montgomery and will publish a new edition of Twain's classic without the N-word. Seems to me that I'm doing something constructive by simply uh, eliminating a word that's a uh, clear uh, barrier for many people. In the entire book, Mark Twain used the N-word 219 times, deliberately, to spotlight 19th century racism. That word meant something. That word means something. At Atlanta's Morehouse University, David Wall Rice says Twain slurs actually help Americans face the issue of racism today. We have to have the discussion about it. We can't skate over it. As a book, Huckleberry Finn was controversial right from its first publication in 1885. Too coarse, critics said. But its racist stereotypes and language are what eat at some critics today, with recent repeated attempts to ban the book. On Twitter today, reaction to editing Twain's text was overwhelmingly negative. Take out the N-word, one person wrote, and you have to take the Holocaust out of Anne Frank and the adultery out of the Scarlet Letter. Rice says the N-word makes people uncomfortable, which helps teach. I mean, you know, if you're going to move forward, there's going to be some agitation, right? You want to make sure that you're going to kind of disturb the equilibrium at least a little bit, or else there's not going to be any growth. Mark Twain started this debate. He had probably liked the last word. I don't give a damn what the whole world says. Mark Strassman, CBS News, Atlanta. check in the chat. Um, that's one thing on this. I remember I saw, saw a video, you know, a discussion about it. And someone's, someone was pretty horrified, and I can't remember who it was. It was a black gentleman said, if they replace the N-word with the word slave, what is that saying if they think that, that, that those words mean the same thing? Because, of course, Jim, who was on the raft um, with Huck, I don't believe he, I think he was not a slave. So totally different dynamics that would totally change the book. What do you guys think? And I think this was a required reading when I was in school. Angie? I remember reading this um, and where I grew up, um, we were the only white family on the block. I think there was one other. Um, and we did not say those words. And so to read it was so incredibly jarring. Um, and I don't, I don't think that you censor history. I think it stands the way that it is because it does start that conversation. I agree, I think as, as a, an English teacher at one time in the classroom, um, no matter what we were reading, um, I think whenever the kids are a little uncomfortable with this situation, I think it gives them that time to reflect on why are they uncomfortable and what does that mean? Um, even a, a much newer book um, I taught, American Born Chinese, the graphic novel, and when I first read that book, I was like, how in the world am I gonna teach this book? Because I was uncomfortable with, with a lot of the, you know, the words that were used and the stereotypes that were there. And that's pretty much how I started teaching the, the graphic novel was, if you aren't feeling uncomfortable at some point, you might, you know, that, that, worry, that will worry me a little bit as a teacher that you're not feeling a little odd that certain words are being used or certain phrases are seen as funny. Um, and I think reading that word or saying certain words out loud is, is very different from having someone read them to themselves when they're reading a book. 
Yeah, I'm glad to have your perspective. That's very interesting. And yeah, what a great way to start the, the course on it. Um, let's see what it says here. In... Okay, Maddie says, um, yeah, agree. History shouldn't be censored and required reading for eighth, ninth grade. Censored ourselves when reading it out loud, but wow, that would be hard to do when there's 219 times. Um, on with the list. And oh, again, Dave Pilkey made the list. Um, Tony Morrison made the list again. Goosebumps is series. In Our Mother's House, I know it's a children's book. In the Catcher in the Rye, yes, that I knew it was on here somewhere. And The Color Purple, has anybody read The Color Purple? It's been on, been on my list forever and I have not read it yet. It gets pretty graphic in a, 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 a rape scene more than one time. The story is amazing, but it's hard to read. Yeah, this again was one that um, a teen book group read um, and discussed. I think um, sometimes as adults, we underestimate what a teen or a child can handle. And um, like that black gentleman said in the prior video, it's, you know, if you're not uncomfortable, um, how or agitated, um, how can change be affected? So though this is about rape, um, it, it's a difficult topic. The teens handled it with a plum, so. And again, what a start to great conversation. Um, yeah, I can let you read through it yourself, but yes, the Holy Bible, um, Eleanor and Park. My mom's having a baby. I know that that is one that is, people have been making the rounds just recently, trying to get them out of libraries just here locally. Um, and again, I think sometimes when it's a kid's book, it's got a little bit different impact for parents. And a little bit more about Eleanor and Park. Has anybody or everybody read this book? Um, Rainbow Rowell is, or Rowell, Rowell. Liz says she loves it. Yeah, I read the book and I loved it. She is from Omaha, Nebraska. So she actually had, um, in 2013, ironically, during band book week, she was supposed to go to Minnesota and they had a parent group, parents actually challenged the book and ultimately banned it. So they told her they did not want her to go to Minnesota after all. And the reason was obscene language, but the book was also deemed inappropriate for the age group because it was pornographic and sexually explicit. <coughs> but like the, the author said, um, obscene language, there were some bullies in the book. The main characters, Eleanor and Park, did not use bad language, and it kind of uses loses its, um, it loses its meaning when someone comes up and said, okay, you big dumb head, instead of, you know, sometimes you need that more powerful language to really reflect. And the, the book is made for high school. It's not like kids haven't heard it. And I guess I don't remember it being hugely sexually explicit. Anybody else have comments on it? Jennifer? Um, I loved the setting because, I mean, that was my time and my place. I remember going to Peony Park and during the 80s. So, you know, it was um, a typical teen storyline. So, yeah, the intended audience is teen. And, of course, they can handle it. It's the uptight adults who get too uptight. I actually wore the um, gym outfit described in the book. <laughs> Me too. Yes. That was awful. Yeah. Was awful. Awful. Yes. Oh my gosh. And yes, Liz those were awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they described it very well. Ugh. 
And Liz said she didn't remember it being sexually explicit at all. Didn't know, doesn't know if they even kiss. Going to have to reread it now. And Maddie said there's, there feels like there is implied sexually explicit incidents, but nothing super out in the open. Yeah, I agree. I didn't. I thought it was a wonderful book. And yeah, I want to read it again now too. Okay. Um, and again, the, I'll let you go ahead and read through the list, but like Anne Frank, you know, who can find offense in that, I wonder. And I remember seeing uh, the Draw Me on a, Draw Me a Star by Eric Carl. I had it in the library, so I did find it. And yeah, there's a couple of pictures that you could, oh, yep, I bet some kids giggle when they see that. But. So there's, goes through number 70. Uh, Jacob's New Dress, that is um, a kid's child's book too, Lolita. Um, 1984, I think I read it again last year. And A Clockwork Orange has always been on my list. I've never read it either. And again, and again Ellen Hopkins, I think, is on the list a few different times. An Ender's Game, I wonder if that is because of the author or if it's because of the book itself. Oh, and a Madeline book. And then the last 10. Uh, Skippy John Jones. I don't quite understand that one. I'll have to look that up. And another Ellen Hopkins book. I need to go back and read her series. <laughs> okay. Well, that is it for the slides. Let's see on the chat. Yeah, Skippy John Jones. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it is on the ALA website. I will stop the share. Uh, so yeah, we have about seven minutes. Any more comments? Did any of the books really surprise you? Skippy John Jones, right? The Librarian of Basara. I have not read that one. I need to look it up and see what that's about. And Tricks is probably the most explicit of Hopkins books. And I agree about the tricks book. We um, we have a lot of Ellen Hopkins here and I read that book and I was not comfortable leaving that book on a shelf for my kids. Um, and um, I had a couple other people read it and we decided that we would we would remove that book on our own accord. Yeah, school libraries have a little bit more of an obligation. I don't know if that's the right word or not. Um, how do you, do you have a policy on how you, on well, what you have on the policy? If someone were to challenge a book um, and we, I've been, I've been a librarian now um, for 16 years and we have only had one book challenged in our library. Um, but yes, we do have district policy, like what you said, where the whoever's bringing um, the issue has to read the entire book. I mean, it, then we get a, a group together of community members, clergy, parents, teachers, and then they have to come to a consensus of whether or not the book stays or goes. Um, but I ultimately order every book that comes in. And so, you know, there's a process I have to go through too. And then ultimately it's, do we, do we keep it or do we not based on our community? Um, and what, what and our kids' needs, and that's kind of how we go from there. So again, curious with uh, the teachers, do you send a list home to parents of what the books required book reading lists are going to be for the year? For every class, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of the syllabus that goes home that has to be signed by parents with the, the list of the books that 
Um, there's, there's way more than you could ever possibly get through. So most teachers are going to put it on their syllabus as this is where we're going to pull from. Um, and we, you know, there, there's always the option for a parent to choose to opt their kid out of a certain, a certain book. Um, it doesn't happen a ton, but you know, every, every once in a while I have a teacher come in and, and want me to find something else for their kid to read that as whether it's common themes or, or something if, if a, a student has, has been opted out of a title. It does not happen very often. Right, that's good. That's what I said. I remember getting the list home when my kids would have required reading. And I always thought that was an okay thing for, you know, if your parents have a problem, then that's the time to stop it. And that's the way to address it is have an alternate option. And Jennifer says, take a look at In the Night Kitchen by Marie Sendek. Hmm, I'll have to look that one up. I'll send the chat along when I send the recording. Oh, cute little naked babies. <laughs> and Liz says, I haven't even read Traffic because I can't bring myself to see what else happens to these poor kids. Wow. Yeah, so anyway, it's almost two o'clock. Um, any other comments or thoughts? Uh, keep in mind that Three Rivers Library System and the other systems too, we do have book kits available if anyone needs them. We have a list on our website. And and yes, if you have a display about banned books week, it would be great to have a a picture or an article or both to put in our newsletter. We're always looking for information so everybody can have a platform for all the great things they do in their libraries. So yes, happy Band Book Week. So I guess we'll go ahead and be gone unless there's more comments. Thank you, Tammy. You bet, thank you. Good seeing everybody. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, thanks. Bye.